welcome to the BNP Paribas Asset Management Talking Heads podcast. I'm Daniel Morris, Chief Market Strategist, and today I'm joined by Olivier de la Rousière, CIO for Fixed Income. As we're all very much aware, we're in the midst of a, a geopolitical, arguably global crisis. One of the few things perhaps that we can say about those are that they're unpredictable and, and very challenging, certainly from an investment point of view. Now let's turn to you, Olivier. Uh, you're running or managing the fixed income portfolios across your business. What's been your reaction to all of this? Yes, Daniel, clearly, uh, clearly a lot on my side, uh, record high volatility within fixed income. I mean, I've been in the sector for 25 years, and honestly, this, is, this has been uh, really impressive. Most strategic positions have been overall short duration for months now, but uh, with a bit more granularity, actually our highest convictions were on curve distortions uh, because we're seeing an aggressive market pricing in terms of uh, hikes in the US and in Europe, uh, so before the recent events. And uh, we thought that the next move would be actually a curve steepening rather than a flattening. Flattening being higher short-term rates and let's say stable uh, longer-term rates. And the next move being stable short-term rates and longer-term rates going up because, because of the uh, next step from the central bank, which is actually the balance sheet reduction. And um, so we're extremely uh, anxious to hear Christine Lagarde yesterday Preparing for uh, for this ECB meeting, we had reduced our positionings overall, I would say, in terms of risk in line with what Maya described, overall on duration, overall on curve distortions, overall on spreads. And uh, maybe later on, we'll touch on liquidity. Uh, clearly, over the last days, liquidity has dropped. We've been increasing our uh, cash positions, reducing some maturity in, in spread positions. So getting ready for the worst just because we're uh, observing this uh, incredible volatility. And hopefully uh, Christine Lagarde confirmed uh, her, uh, um, I mean, our expectations and some visibility over the next quarters. I think uh, this has reassured markets. And again, um, we will probably in the next step is, is coming back to those uh, more risky trades on curve and spreads. But uh, we've adapted to the recent volatility. Uh, let's step back a bit. Appreciate, you know, you've had to manage the portfolios in the short term. I'm curious to hear kind of what's changed in terms of your medium term views. And on one hand, uh, yeah, arguably, it's a bit more of the same. We had inflation before we had more inflation. Now, uh, central <coughs> banks still hiking. Uh, but I imagine uh, what you thought might do well this year and might do poorly uh, has altered somewhat. Are there any views that you've changed in terms of what you do expect for returns uh, this year out of different sub-asset classes in your world? Well, clearly the implications of uh, inflation and rising inflation do uh, change, completely change the picture within fixed income. We thought we had visibility. We thought uh, the uh, Central bankers had this uh, in hand, uh, and this isn't only a short-term question. This is a longer-term one. Uh, we're now revising our inflation uh, expectations for this year and for next year. Uh, we might even see some double-digit figures. That's what I've seen now from some uh, accounts party and research. Double-digit figures in the US. Uh, this is uh, definitely going to scare a number of people and starting with central bankers. So I would say that, uh, of course, a uh, uh, difficult situation of much higher inflation and poor visibility on growth. Even Christine Lagarde, who yesterday was very clear about uh, the path for a balance sheet reduction, uh, was a lot less clear about uh, her GDP forecast and, uh, and even said she would be data dependent at the end of this year and that she would adapt her policy to, uh, to the data observed. So just saying this has major implications for us because it always starts with central bankers. Uh, but in terms of strategies, in terms of uh, higher convictions, it has to be on the spread side. Uh, we thought that, uh, I mean, that was the situation a few weeks ago. Fundamentals looked really strong. Valuations looked stretched. That was, uh, that was very obvious. And we had been reducing risks. We need to accelerate on this. Uh, clearly, the fundamentals are being challenged on the credit side, both on IG and high yield. I mean, valuation is getting more attractive, but that's only a, a consequence of a weaker fundamentals. I'm not saying corporates are doing poorly. Uh, of course, uh, we've seen we've seen the levels of uh, issuance 
they have benefited from the uh, very uh, uh, supportive and, and, and low yield conditions. Uh, so they've been, of course, uh, borrowing a lot and uh, and keeping that cash uh, for for future investments. We think the future is more uncertain for a number of sectors, uh, obviously certain sectors like the auto sector, and in a way they will need those uh, those cash reserves. So uh, more cautious about the spread sector than we were. We were already quite cautious, but clearly accelerating on, on our uh, reducing of exposure, I would say. So I think in your remarks previously, you mentioned liquidity, you, you mentioned volatility, and I would think of the asset classes we're discussing here. Uh, that's one of the bigger changes for you. I think you always worry about liquidity uh, in fixed income in times of stress. Uh, so uh, how have, I guess, how do you see the environment currently? How challenged uh, is liquidity? Uh, and inevitably, then, how do you manage around that? Yes, I, I, I did mention this. We manage uh, large assets and we provide daily liquidity within our NAV. So just to say we're, this is, we're mindful of this because we are active managers and, and want to be and, and, and need to be. Um, so just saying we've adapted like we always do in, in terms of uh, in periods of crisis. And it starts basically with raising cash within our funds. Um, I would say uh, the standard portion of cash is probably something like zero to 5%. Uh, there are in some of our funds where close to 15, 20 percent of our of, of holding in cash or extremely uh, liquid bonds. And uh, a big part of my business is focusing on short duration, not only money market, but short duration fixed income. I can tell you in, in these businesses, we have uh, holdings as large as uh, 30 to 50 percent of the assets under one year of maturity. But just saying we're, we're ready for tougher times. But of course, this can have a cost. So we're always mindful of performance as well because uh, we're not sure about how long this is going to last. So just to say, on the rest of the funds, we're extremely active. And there we have very useful resources uh, like the trading desk, uh, which is just as specialized as we are in the subsectors of fixed income. So we get uh, a lot of uh, regular and uh, very granular information on where liquidity stands within sectors, within maturities, because it's not an overall illiquid situation. It's every day a surprise on where we can trade. Uh, and I can tell you, it's not always about high yield and EM. Uh, sometimes I've heard my PMs complain about uh, illiquid uh, linkers in the sovereign space. So we need to adapt and turn to uh, the most active parts of weather market trades. And uh, MIFID has helped, you know, on fixed income, it used to be more opaque. Now we have a, a lot of data. This requires resources to, uh, to uh, um, use this data. And, and we have been over the last years investing in people and, and tools uh, for more market, man market monitoring. Uh, this has helped uh, during the pandemic crisis, during this crisis. We have all the information that we need on where liquidity stands every day prior to taking these investment decisions. And, and as you know, uh, fixed income, and maybe not everyone knows, uh, often has very high turnovers in the portfolio. So just saying it's not because we have more cash within our funds that we're uh, less active, uh, but it requires additional work with the trading functions. So again, focusing on different sectors, different maturities, and that changes every day. So let's uh, change tack just a bit. BNP has been committed to sustainability for a while now. Our, our tagline, not incidentally, is a sustainable investor for a changing world. And I think one of the maybe uh, unexpected consequences of the crisis is an even uh, higher emphasis on a realization of the importance of the energy transition and, and renewables. Um, so I want to ask about the implications uh, for debt, given that there are discussions about uh, issuing some debt to support the transition. But uh, as I think we all know, you can't uh, keep issuing debt indefinitely. Well, on my side, uh, there are very different uh, answers to your question, Daniel. And it starts with uh, the nature of, uh, of issuance. Of course, on the fixed income side, we've been very happy with the developments uh, on the, on the thematic bonds, the, the sustainable bonds, uh, both green bonds, social bonds more recently. And, um, and it's very obvious that uh, with the most recent discussions about uh, war issuance in terms of uh, financing uh, defense, uh, that might not look very green. Uh, 
uh, just to say public institutions have really helped that development in the market and, and internally as you may know or can imagine uh, there is definitely a premium for all pms to invest in those green bonds or social bonds uh, versus versus then benchmarks so just to say saying we've been pushing hard for this and uh, and we can see this in in, in our assets um, now what we're mentioning here, which is different in terms of nature of financing, I did mention the level of cash. So I'm not really worried about the issuance. I'm not worried about the appetite for investors. As always, it's the nature of the investors we'll be looking at. And I'm very sure that, uh, that we'll be seeing uh, a major appetite from local investors uh, to buy these, these bonds which are always cheap. I mean, uh, we're saying rates are higher, but actually overall, of course, yields is still very low. It's very cheap uh, uh, for uh, public institutions or even corporates uh, to, to borrow and finance uh, those, those, um, those needs. Just to say, appetite is there, will be there. Uh, it's a major turn in, in the sector allocation, which was uh, turning a lot more green, definitely. Uh, and, and something else I would add, maybe because I'm a, I'm a Euro fan, uh, just to say the recent discussions about, uh, you know, Euro or European jumbo bonds to finance this is always good news. Uh, we need this in the very long cycle of European construction. Uh, it's, it reinforces the Euro bloc. Having a global Euro policy to manage these questions is always a great uh, turn in, in this crisis, like in the previous ones. And, uh, and I've taken this very positively, and I'm sure European and international investors uh, will support these uh, these upcoming uh, needs. Olivier, emerging market debt, uh, Russia, Ukraine, uh, uh, clearly uh, potentially one of the most impacted areas. Uh, again, how has that team uh, assessed the situation and managing uh, the environment? It's clearly a shock because uh, Russian debt was uh, extremely solid, at least on the FX reserve side, I mean, with the central bank and, and the debt itself. Of course, there were some corporate risks, but uh, just to say, Russia was uh, one of the stable parts uh, uh, within the EM uh, close to Europe world. Um, so it is a shock. Ukraine was clearly uh, was, was already uh, quite fragile. So purely in terms of uh, investing in in those two countries. Um, they are part of the benchmark. So I would say everything, everyone tends to have an opinion on these debts. And, uh, and we did. Uh, we did have a, a, a positive, uh, opportunistic uh, stance on both debts. Uh, but of course, as always, on, on, on EM debt, you know, we don't only manage rates. We manage rates, spreads, and currencies, and very often in, in, uh, in different ways because this offers diversification. So it was also the case. We've been extremely tactical, I would say, on the three leverages, looking at some corporates, high-quality corporates, uh, trading very tactically the sovereign debts and also very tactically the currency. So uh, this is a, this is a clearly a difficult moment for uh, EMPMs who are naturally all exposed uh, to these debts, uh, being in the benchmarks. Um, and uh, I would say we're risk managers. So uh, as always, we manage uh, uh, some exposures versus others. Um, we have been reducing risks elsewhere uh, in countries where we had bought protection. Uh, uh, countries like uh, China, for example, where we're positive as well. We've been buying protection. Other areas, oil producers where we were underweight, we've actually been uh, uh, reducing our, our protection or buying these, uh, these sectors uh, as, as a hedge to, uh, um, to these exposures in Eastern Europe, I would say. So again, actively managing all leverages, uh, rates, uh, spreads, uh, and effects across across the globe, because this has implications across the globe. So I think we have uh, time for a lightning round question. So just a quick response on your highest conviction view right now. Um, I just mentioned EM. I think it's, uh, as always, a great reminder for diversification. So in every allocation within fixed income, do consider EM, it really, I mean, you, you're getting paid for your risks. Uh, this is, uh, as an investor, this is always what I've, uh, I'm looking for. Uh, we're great duration managers or curve managers or spread managers, but diversify your risks. So keep EM inside and in, in, in your allocations. Well, that's all we have time for today. 
If you'd like more information, please reach out to your BNP Paribas Asset Management contact or check out our Investors Corner blog. For listeners who have devices with Alexa, you can ask Alexa to enable Investment Insights or search for Investment Insights on Amazon under the category Alexa Skills. My thanks to Olivier for sharing his insights. Please join me next week when I'll be speaking with Maya Bondari about the implications of the Ukraine conflict for multi-asset portfolios. Until then, we hope you stay safe and take care. This podcast presentation includes a discussion on current market events and is not intended as investment advice or an offer of products or services by BMP Paribas Asset Management. Please keep in mind that the information and analysis in this presentation is only current as of the publication date.